technology is always disruptive, and but the, the, the process of disruptive technology is how it gets applied. How does it become, um, you know, proliferated throughout individuals and, and companies? I subtitled this 7 billion connected devices by 2025. I used to work with Cisco Systems. I was on a team that was beginning to develop what we were calling the Internet of Everything. It's now morphed into the, the Internet of Things. And we came up with a, what we thought was a very optimistic forecast back in 2010, 2011, that maybe 60 billion devices would get connected by 2025. Recently, uh, Morgan Stanley uh, produced a report that said that number is probably going to be more like 70 billion. If you look at the momentum of, um, of the uh, proliferation of devices throughout uh, the world, we're probably going to even exceed, exceed that by 70 billion. I'm sure that many of us already have connected devices in our home, and we're going to be adding many, many, many more. Um, IoT is, a, is, is not so much a disruptive technology as it is a disruptive application. And what I mean by that, there's many technologies inside IoT, and there's many verticals inside IoT, and each of these verticals will have a different kind of application and adoption. Um, one vertical that I'm very interested in is insurance. I've been working with insurance companies, not by choice, but by circumstance, because we've been trying to, ever since Cisco, to try to get insurance companies, health, auto, life, and home, to understand what does IoT really mean to them? How is this really going to affect um, the way that they do business? How do they provide products? How they provide services to their customers? Insurance is a legacy industry. It is very resistant, naturally, to change. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They do a really good job of analyzing risk, um, but they do not do a good job at analyzing change. And one thing that they do understand now is that IoT, in its greater sense, can be very disruptive to their business models. And I've been working with them for the last three to four years to try to smooth that transition. We pretty much see ourselves as a bridge to insurance companies, especially home insurance companies, as they adopt um, various IoT opportunities. Which button do I press? That one? OK. Um, every disruptive technology has an adoption curve. And this curve is generic, but the products on and the services on that you know, curve are not necessarily generic. What, if I was to maybe modify this for IoT, I would have elongated the left-hand side here, way over here, because IoT as, a, as, a, as an idea, as a, as a collection of technologies, has been relatively slow to adopt. We've been working with adoption since 20... 2009, 2010, and it has been very hard to kind of get that kind of momentum. The early adoption phase has been very dynamic. We've seen companies like um, um, Hue, Light, uh, Hue Light Bulbs from Philips to really good um, position in the marketplace, but mainly they were attracting the early adopters. You know, the shiny object, which which you know tends to attract various um, you know, early adopters, but it didn't really evolve into something that was an ecosystem or you know any kind of service that could be expandable. Um, we also saw in the early part of 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 of, um, of IoT adoption, various companies like ADT, Pulse, or Iris, you know their smart home ecosystem. These were systems that were relatively closed. Um, they were developed to be all-inclusive of certain products, but if you had a product that was kind of outside that ecosystem, you probably had a difficult time getting it adapted and integrated, and the customer usually got uh, uh, a lot of frustration. I was very much involved, I don't know if you can see this logo here, but Staples Connect was a, sim a similar thing. We tried to put, I was working with a company that designed that for Staples, and what we were trying to do is make an ecosystem that was, re that was available through retail, um, it was very difficult. The consumer didn't understand it. And what we also discovered, and, you know, Mark, you were saying things about, you know, how the, you know, things in one part of the world can be interpreted in, in very different in the other part of the world. Um, the salespeople didn't understand how to sell the smart home. Um, so we, we, we came away from that very frustrated because we thought we had a complete, you know, unique ecosystem. Uh, we had we had lights. We had we had security. We had all different kinds of devices that would make the smart home smart, but the salespeople didn't understand how to sell it. Smart Things, another you know ecosystem provider. You know early on to the market, you know we were transitioning from single devices into maybe uh, you know little closed ecosystems. Created a lot of 
tourists and, and, and into what they were offering, but they still the market momentum wasn't quite there. Then we started seeing things like Comcast or um, you know, again, ADT polls come into the market where they're beginning to offer more of a, a focus on security, for example. How do we really penetrate this market with smart home and smart devices? What we're seeing now, and, and again, where I place these isn't necessarily accurate because, again, every vertical market has a totally different adoption curve. But what we're seeing emerge now and will probably be a continuation here for the next, you know, in, at least, you know, five years is the smart home as a service. Um, and we're seeing various platforms be promoted such as Vivint, a very interesting uh, business model to follow. We're seeing interesting partnerships, Ring and ADD Pulse, which were conceivably competitors to each other are now merging together to start offering more of a, a, an open ecosystem to the home and the user can bring products in, the products can be easily configurable to that service. And it, the company, whether it's Comcast or Vivint or somebody else, they're not really controlling necessarily the devices that are going into the home. What they're doing is providing a management service to that, that homeowner. Um, so I've kind of calculated or I kind of placed you know, in terms of IoT adoption, you know, under this generic curve here, we started off with the, seeing the market that was very device centric. Could be light bulbs, it could be automated shades. I used to work with a company that was embedding a smart chip into your rice cooker or to your coffee maker. And the novelty was that I could be at work or any place in the world for that matter and I could start my coffee. Cute but not really expandable. That's not a basis for a business model. Um, but what we're seeing now is, is real companies, like the insurance company that has some very specific issues that need to be solved, and they're trying to leverage IoT technologies um, into that. And this is beginning to open up what I think is, is more of a service model for IoT or for the, you know, the smart home. And we're beginning to call this you know, the, the uh, smart home as a service. So now we go into you know, a little bit more detail of what the insurance companies are confronted with. Um, I've called this a peace of mind ecosystem. And there's been a lot of studies that have been done in households, mainly in North America. What does the homeowner really want? And they want peace of mind. And peace of mind you know, is, is, consists of a variety of, of devices and services. At the top of every homeowner's um, is security. They want to know that their home is safe and secure, that their kids are protected, that their house is, is, uh, is protected from intrusion or break-ins. So, you know, in the surveys I've seen that, you know, the number one um, wish that homeowners want is they want to know that their house is safe. And this is being represented by Ring, for example, a, 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 a door lock that has a, a, um, a, um, a camera inside. And very important for if you get packages from Amazon, like most of us do, at least in the States, every day, you want to make sure that that package is there. And, but if you have a Ring security system, you can, you'll be notified if that's being taken off of your front porch. Smoke and fire and carbon monoxide detection is very, very important. In fact, in, in many ways, it's required by law to have some of these alerts in. So these are two things that are very important with um, homeowners. We want security and we want protection from fire, smoke, and, and gas. But there's a missing link here. And that missing link has, all, has been in water damage detection uh, for that perfect ecosystem, that system that the, uh, the home insurance providers are looking for. And the reason why the insurance companies want this kind of ecosystem placed in the home is because, number one, it's what we call, we, it mitigates risk. Um, if you have a complete ecosystem in the house, a smart home application uh, as a service inside the home that monitors any kind of damage, you're going to be able to reduce that risk of, of an incident occurring. And if you can reduce the incident from occurring, you're going to reduce the number of claims that are, are filed or are, are you know filed every year so if, if you can mitigate risk you can reduce the incident of claims you can reduce the cost of the claims if you're notified say for example that there is a drip 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 in the bathroom and you receive an alert that that drip is detectable you can probably mitigate the risk by getting that drip drip fixed 
before it becomes a flood, before it becomes very damaging. So mitigating risk, reducing the cost of claims, but also one thing that the insurance companies are very interested in IoT is that it increases customer interaction. In the United States, and I'm probably you know, true all around the world, is that your interaction with the insurance company usually happens once or twice a year when you have to pay a bill, which is negative, or when you file a claim, which is super negative. So most people perceive their insurance companies, you know, I don't want to deal with my insurance company. In fact, there's two industries that are always ranked at the bottom of customer satisfaction. The worst ranked company, at least in the United States, are cable providers, Comcast, you know, AT&T, Cox. Everybody hates their cable provider, their, 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 their broadband provider. That's known. The second worst appreciated industry is your home insurance provider because they fight claims. You never feel like you get enough money out of that claim. And there's always this castle going back and forth. So what's interesting, though, is that insurance companies are a trusted brand, whether it's State Farm or you know, the, you know, Liberty Mutual, the variety of, of insurance companies in the states. Everybody trusts their brand because it's, they've been around and they have provided service. But it's that kind of trust that you hate to love. And so insurance companies look at IoT and the intercommunication capabilities of IoT through alert, alerts, for example, as a way to sort of package a new way of communicating to the customers. For example, if you were to have a smart home system that would provide an alert that there is smoke or there is a, a water, potential water damage, and that alert not only went to you as the homeowner so that you could, take, you know, you could mitigate the risk and take care of the damage, but let's say that alert also went to your insurance company, and immediately the insurance company could text back to you, oh, you know, here's a claim application. We want to be a little proactive here. Here's a claim application that you can file right away, you know, if there is in fact damage that has to be, you know, claimed for. So there's all different kinds of ways that you can start leveraging communications on top of this technology that the insurance companies see as being very opportunistic. Another thing that insurance companies are really excited about with IoT is that it opens as to new relationships. A smart home that has all these devices that are connected is inevitably going to reduce the risk of damage happening in that house. And insurance is all about risk management. Uh, they develop these huge risk pools for which they can determine the kind of rates they're going to charge for their insurance. But if that risk pool starts to diminish, that means the financial pool that insurance companies operate within is also going to diminish. And so there's kind of a, you know, whenever there's an opportunity, there's always a challenge. Whenever there's a risk, there's always a reward. And navigating through all this with the insurance companies is always, it's a challenge. But what they're worried about is they have these huge risk pools, which are great financial pools for them. And look at the automobile insurance, for example. This is something that's been very disruptive and very scary for insurance companies, and it's an eye-opener on what can happen with um, other segments like home insurance. I was reading the other day that um, by 2025, we will see a reduction in the United States by 70% of auto insurance policies as we know them today. Um, and this is like, wow, this is the core business for a lot of insurance companies. And if you're going to see a reduction by 70% in, say, what, seven years, eight years, that is a major challenge to the existing business model. You know, new safety equipment, you know, is really, you know, um, reducing the risk of driving a car in the United States. And so people are saying, why am I still paying the same price for my policy that I was five years ago, or even seeing an increase when, in fact, the the risk of having an injury, the risk of having an accident has gone way down. So the risk pool is shrinking. And the same thing is going to happen with a smart home, especially a smart home that has a, you know, as a, as a service applied to it also. You know, the incident of smoke damage, the incident of fire, the incident of water damage is going to be decreased. So homeowners are beginning to ask their insurance providers, why do I have the same insurance policy with all this protection that I had five years ago, you know, you should be, you know, doing something a little bit different. This is going to introduce the what we call usage-based insurance, and this is going to radically change the market. So, insurance companies need to start looking out beyond their traditional 
business models, for new business models. And one of the business models that, that opportunities is for insurance companies to start working with a, a, a different set of companies. For example, in what we're doing now with insurance companies, we're taking a product, and I'll, I'll show you a slide. Product is um, probably going to encourage insurance companies to get into maybe distribution business themselves. They can actually you know, deliver the product to the customers, or they can work with third-party distribution channels, or they can work with various other home service providers, or they can work with, you know, retailers also. So there's, there's a whole array of new business partnership opportunities available to insurance companies through an IoT smart home ecosystem. But, like, you know, whenever there's an opportunity, there's a challenge. And the insurance companies see themselves as being the core component to a smart home ecosystem, but they don't want a management. This is why I think, you know, we look at companies like Vivint, for example. Down the road, there could be even an insurance relationship between a company like Vivint, a company like Comcast, and the insurance provider to start providing a whole home smart, you know, peace of mind ecosystem. So as I said, the the, the peace of mind ecosystem is almost complete. We've got home security, we've got smoke, fire, and gas detection, but the missing link has always been in water detection. And I want to talk a little bit about water damage as a case study here. Um, and this is why it's so important to the insurance company, and this is why I think the insurance companies are going to love the company that I'm representing right now. Um, in the United States, more than 14,000 water damage claims are filed every day. And the average cost of those claims is, on the low side, 8,000. I just read a report this morning that the average cost is now getting pretty close to $10,000. That's the average. There's a huge array here on, on, on what the cost will be. We have a neighbor in Seattle who left on a six-month sabbatical. <laughs> you know what's going to happen. Um, drip, drip, drip in the upstairs bathroom. Drip, drip, drip. And by the time she came home, the inside of the house was pretty much fully damaged. She had nobody taking care of the house while she was gone. She had no detectors inside the house. Fortunately, Chubb was her insurance policy provider, but the, the cost of repairing the house was, was almost a million dollars. So that's the high side. But we all have, you know, we all know people who have had water damage. In fact, I was reading also that um, today, well, it, it, I think it's actually more frequent now, but one in 10 homes every 10 years is going to have a major water damage file to uh, the file. What I read this morning was that's now one in every eight years, one, one house in every eight years is going to have to have, yeah, I'm sorry, one in eight homes every eight years will file a water damage claim. Now, there's 80 million home policies in the United States. Multiply this out, you can see why this is such a big issue, because billions and billions of dollars are being spent by insurance companies every year to you know, correct the damage that was done um, by water damage. And I don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of a confidential figure. Some people say it's only three, three, only $3 billion a year. Some say five. I actually have a pretty good idea that's probably closer. Seven billion dollars a year is spent by insurance companies to correct water damage. That's the situation. On the other side of the equation is the opportunity. And this is where it gets really interesting. This is why IoT is a bridge between a traditional business model like insurance companies and what is really happening to you know individualized insurance policies. Fifty percent, and this is a report that was done by the Boston Group, 50% of U.S. homeowners, that's basically 40 million households, would be willing to install a water mitigating, a water damage mitigating uh, solution if it was offered by their insurance provider. That is 40 million homes listening to their insurance provider. That's a very positive relationship between a, a homeowner and a, an insurance provider. But if these devices were installed, they believe, or, or Boston Consulting Group believes that, that water damage claims could be reduced by 70%. Now, calculate that, you know, uh, by what's being spent today and the number of incidents that water damage is being uh, incurred every day in the U.S. And the cost of those claims could 
go down by 80%. So this is a huge, huge, huge opportunity. And what's interesting about this is it really challenges um, the way that IoT is beginning to you know, proliferate or beginning to take momentum in the United States. In the beginning, it was very much a technology-driven you know, opportunity. Um, here's a cute device that can change the, the lights in your house with a remote uh, with your phone. Now it's being driven by real use cases that are going to save not only companies uh, billions and billions of dollars, but homeowners millions of headaches. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating. We just had, I live in a, in a building that had a fire. And um, the fire didn't cause much damage. The damage was caused by the fire hoses. And it was, a, it was almost a $3 million uh, 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 fix. And the biggest issue was prevent mold. But the hassle, we had to live for almost a year and a half with you know, scaffolding and all different kinds of, of, uh, uh, of stuff around that you know, really made living in this one building very, very unappealing. So if you can reduce the incident of, of water damage, if you can re reduce the cost of claims when water damage does occur, this is a really a win-win between both the insurance provider and, and the homeowner. And this is the, the solution that we see. This is a product that is being developed by Alexa USA um, and with our partners here in China. Um, and there was a quote from CE Pro that said a, a, about a year ago when we first started previewing this is, what Nest did for climate management, Guardian will do for water control. That's kind of you know, mixing maybe a little bit of apples and oranges because you know, obviously you know, you know, climate control is a little bit different than, than water management. But we do believe that in terms of customer recognition and customer you know, excitement, we believe that Guardian will have a major impact on the marketplace. And the reason why this is so important is because the insurance companies don't want to promote or support anything that isn't easy to install, that isn't automatically configurable, that isn't cost effective, and doesn't have a lot of other features and benefits that really kind of play into that whole business model behind what an insurance provider wants to do with their, their homeowners. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, on, on the, the specifications on, on this product, but we're now beginning to, to launch this in the United States. And fortunately, and I think we're extremely fortunate to be able to have um, 10 of the top 20 insurance providers in the United States currently testing Guardian for eventual rollout into their, into their, to their, um, their customers. Very, very successful and very well received. I'm going to probably be in the shortest presentation here, which will mean open up time for more questions. But in conclusion here, what I want to say, the, the thing that what we're really excited about is that we're seeing the technology finally drive new business models. And in the beginning, you know, this is a very interesting series of presentations where we start off with, you know, here's some very interesting technology on antennas. And that's a key, you know, step process of adoption. Then we talk about various trial and error models. You know, let's throw out some crazy ideas on the wall and see what really sticks. Some of them will, some of them won't. But we're really training kids or, or young people on how to develop products in this new era. But now we're actually taking real products that solve real problems for real people and various other enterprises. And it's changing the, the entire business model for the insurance market. Traditionally, insurance companies have been very focused on repair. Now they're focused on preventing. That's a very positive, that's a major shift if you know insurance companies to start thinking about preventing as opposed to repair. Um, another key impo uh, 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 important component on this is data. Insurance companies are very good at big data. They have all these actuary tables. They know how to analyze neighborhoods and say X percent are going to experience flood, X percent are going to experience fire, but they don't know how to pinpoint it to an individual house and try to, to, to analyze what is the risk associated with that house. The kind of data that is coming up from these devices is it's huge. It's microdata. And integrating that into their big data models is, is a challenge. I think from a developer point of view, there's a real opportunity. And it's, it's called InsureTech. You know, but we're seeing a lot of companies, especially in the United States, small startup companies, try to, to understand how to integrate microdata with macrodata. And the insurance companies are really struggling with this. They're investing very heavily in startups because they see that the microdata is really the key to analyzing and predicting you know, the security, the safety of the individual homes. New products. Insu 
who, who associates insurance companies with new products? But insurance companies are beginning to think more like marketeers in that, you know, if we can develop individual products for individual houses, we can be much more, um, um, you know, um, unique to, to the consumer. There's a company in Canada called Desjardins. It's an insurance provider, very large insurance provider up there. They are one of the most innovative um, insurance companies I've ever had the experience to work with. Um, and they are looking at products constantly like you know, any major consumer product company should. And they're integrating their various products together. For example, in Canada, if you travel outside of Canada, you are required to have a health insurance policy that will go with you because Canadian National Health doesn't travel with you. So what they've done, and it's a pilot program, but I think it's very successful. And they provide health insurance, they provide life insurance, they provide auto insurance, and they provide home insurance. As you pull out of the garage, your, your application will do an analysis, did you secure the home? Are the windows locked? Are the doors locked? Whatever the protocol is that you've adopted for securing your home. And you pull out and it gives you a little alert, your house is secure, goodbye. And then it detects that maybe you're driving to the airport. And it, you'll get an alert as you're driving towards the airport, oh, remember that you need to get a health insurance policy if in fact you are traveling out of Canada. Click here and we'll add a, an international health policy to your existing health you know, insurance policy. And then it, it's just that kind of thinking that is so out of the box for insurance providers, but it's taking a look at you as an individual in every aspect of your daily life and trying to add value through various you know, products and services. This is really exciting. But you have to understand, insurance companies are not traditionally very exciting. For them to get out of their box and start thinking like an individual, what can we do as opposed to saying, here's one silo called health insurance, here's one silo called home insurance, and here's another one called auto insurance, but have some sort of seamless integration brought to you by IoT applications, operate as some sort of smart home as a service you know, application, is really, really beginning to interest the insurance companies. And I think we're going to see a lot of insurance companies get very involved in, in this, this opportunity. They have this attitude, adapt or die, and they're, really, they're very much afraid of, of disintermediation. For example, um, I know that there was a, an, a, um, a, um, uh, an e-commerce company a couple of years ago in Japan. It wasn't Amazon, it was something that was local to Japan. But they bought a home insurance company. And if you look at Amazon, for example, um, they may be out there marketing insurance policies. Um, so if the and the farmers and the state farms of the world don't understand how to market on a mass uh, market basis their various products and services. There may be a, a company like an Amazon, somebody that does have millions and millions of customers that they, they can just add a home insurance. Underwriting is one aspect of insurance that is really boring and doesn't really make a difference who does that. It's the brand that's on top that really is important. Um, and as I said before, interactive communications, this is really becoming an opportunity and integrated into the new business models for insurance providers. How do we communicate, not just twice a year, but twice a day? You know, for example, um, the Guardian has some built-in temperature sensors. If that insurance company has access to the temperature sensors, they could be sending alerts out to the homeowner, oh gee, a freeze is on its way. Are your pipes protected? Or there's a typhoon on, on, on its way. Are your rain gutters um, you know, cleared? So being proactive in these communications is really having a major impact on the, um, on, on the business models. And finally, like I said, distribution. Insurance companies are not really um, in the business today of distributing product, but they will be by association with other third parties in getting certain products out there that will help reduce the risk and, and, and chance of damage. Anyway, I just got the, the signal that our time is up. So um, I hope this was, was interesting. This is a little bit different from some of the other presentations, but what we're seeing is a, the emergence of new business models driven by IoT. And if there's any questions, I would be happy to take it. Thank you very much.